If this is your first No Spiro podcast episode, you have sure chosen one hell of a controversial episode to get in on. G'day guys, my name is Shrek, the host of the No Spiro podcast, and today's episode is self-titled for a reason. It's all about diving alone, the practicality of it and the utility of it at times, but also the dangers of it and the inherent risk and the um, extra risk that you are accepting if you do choose to dive alone. Because when you go diving, your only piece of safety equipment is your buddy. However, if you choose to go diving alone and you accept that extra risk, there are some ways you can go about it. Um, we talk about all of that today. Real frank chat with Pat Swanson, good mate of mine from New Zealand, ex uh, spearfishing champion. I only met him a couple of years ago. Went over and dived with him uh, two years ago, and we've had a few good exchanges ever since. And he sent me in this story a while ago, and wanted to get this conversation started. And I've sat on it for a while. And um, we preach a lot about diving in pairs on this on this show, and it's for good reason. It's because you you know your buddy is your best source of safety you know should something go wrong and things frequently do in spearfishing if you've listened to you know the new spirit podcast for a while you've heard tons of stories about blackouts and near misses and uh often the only saving feature of these stories is a good dive buddy and so while people do dive alone it's inherently far more risky than doing it with a buddy. But today's episode is just a frank chat about it. It's prompted by a listener question as well, who was just honest. Um, he's diving really shallow. He's only just started. He's in a state where the water's cold and dirty and he hasn't got anyone to go diving with. And um, Pat's also very much like that, the part of New Zealand where he lives. Uh, it's frequently dirty when you do get a diving window. You take the opportunities when and where you can, and sometimes that means diving alone. But I'll also say this. The water's fairly shallow for the most part, you know, less than 30 feet. And uh, Pat's a, a gun diver. He's been doing it for years, and, you know, he's made as many mistakes and had as many near misses as, as anyone else. Um, so, yeah, really good chat today. Frank chat. I'm just going to hook straight in. The other thing I'll mention is if you want to check out any of the – I've talked about two other podcast episodes and a blog post that's mentioned in this episode go to newspero.com forward slash i dive alone that's newspero.com forward slash i dive alone they'll be linked up in here as well as anything else we chatted about and um go to patreon.com forward slash newspero if you want to support the show uh, there's 17 other legends on there supporting this show every episode is powered by them all that money funds trips where i come out and do live interviews in your part of the world melbourne trip scheduled for november just ironing out the details now. You should hear about it very soon. Let's hook in. I dive alone. Today's Dynamite Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by spearfishing.com.au. That's right, the fine folks over at Adreno have been supporting the Noob Spiro podcast since about episode 18. And they help pay the bills around here. Just want to encourage you to check out spearfishing.com.au and use the code NoobSpiro. You can save 20 bucks on every purchase over 200. But it's just a great online shopping experience. The reviews are phenomenal. If you want to check out a new spear gun, new pair of booties, new pair of gloves, someone's used them before, they've written a review, it's on their website, it's all there, right for, there for you. Head along to spearfishing.com.au and thank you for shopping with that. Today's major sponsor, Adreno. This is a super stoke news bulletin. I am traveling down to Melbourne next week for a live interview in store at Adreno the 9th of November. James from At Southern Spearfishing is joining me to chat all about hunting southern bluefin tuna. It's going to be awesome. That fishery has come back strong in the last 10 years because of good management and the fish are coming through in numbers down there, but you've got to get it right. James is going to help us understand how to do that and uh, it's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to it. We're also doing a live Q&A round table with uh, Club Spearfish President Sven Franklin, Adreno Store Manager Luke Latham. James is going to join us. We're going to have live Q&A, pizza, beer everything 9th of november saturday melbourne thank you to the patrons that have supported this awesome if you want to support it go to patreon.com forward slash noob spiro jump on there you can support us on a buy episode basis and legends have done that so far that's how i'm going down to melbourne awesome i'm super looking forward to this anyway that was my interruption let's get into this interview Pat, great to have you with me again, man. Let me uh, just get this sort of uh, off my chest and give you a bit of explanation before we hook in. I'll give you a bit of a summary, what kicked me off. He says, hey guys, I'm a new spirit living in Boston, Massachusetts. 
Spending most of my weekends in Cape Cod, I have just had my first spearing adventure, which consisted of a lot of swallowing salt water and shooting a fish with a spear that I lost to being, due to being so excited that I didn't lift it out of the water in time for it to keep from wriggling away. I'm wondering, you always speak of avoiding diving alone, but I have only one friend who is into this and I'm looking for a community, but it's sparse in my, in my state. Would you say that even just snorkeling with a spear gun alone by the shore is a bad idea? I felt like it wasn't anything involving deep water or diving at all for that matter, but I get paranoid now he hearing about all these blackouts. This water was not even 10 feet deep in some parts. Uh, I'm mainly spearing around rock jetties and old boardwalks. What do you think? And um, we, we, we talk the talk a lot on the show. Um, but I dive alone as well, and you know that. Um, particularly when it's shallower water and you just don't have a dive buddy, you're like, what are your options like? So, and, I, and then I remember what you wrote to me ages ago, and I thought, well, maybe you need to have a bit more of a practical nuts and bolts look at it and a bit more of a discussion rather than just preaching and not necessarily doing it myself. So I just, I felt like I wasn't, don't have any integrity with this issue because I dive alone occasionally. I prefer to dive with buddies, to be honest. But sometimes I go out with people when you might as well be diving alone anyway. And it doesn't matter how well I behave, they don't. So it's just like, like they'll dive, I'll be there waiting for them when they get up to the surface and then I dive and I come back up and they're not even fucking there. And, and that happens for four or five hours. And, like, and I don't complain about it because sometimes you're out on their vessel or you know, you're just with an unfamiliar bunch of guys and you just accept it for what it is. But you just sort of grade your diving accordingly. You know, I make sure I have a longer surface interval, I don't push it, and I just apply a few more safety sort of um, considerations to my own diving practice. And I, I think that's the same whenever you dive alone. So I, I very much want to talk with you about this because you've got a strong opinion about it. Well, my view is like... There are, there are some, if, if you look at it rationally, there's some obvious um, advantages to diving with a buddy. And um, safety is probably the biggest thing as long as you're doing proper buddy diving. And, and as you say, um, you know, a lot of people buddy dive but don't really buddy dive. Um, mm. But doing it properly, and I, you know, I, I think that that's the big advantage. Um, I can't remember which of your guests that you were talking to, but one of them was saying, you know, you actually land more fish diving with a buddy as well, you know, because mm. um, uh, there's some, somebody there to do a backup shot or, you know, come and help you with the fish that's been holed up or whatever. And, mm. you know, I can definitely see those advantages. A and also, to be fair, you know, sharing the experience with buddies. Um, but, you know, I I've also probably like everybody, I've, I've had the, 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 <laughs> the less enjoyable side of, of buddying with people that, you know, maybe doesn't suit you to dive with so well. You know, they mm. they maybe don't have your same capabilities or they're just plain annoying or they don't manage their, their rig lines properly or whatever, you know. And yeah. you know, I like I like developing new divers and, and and things like that, but it can get pretty frustrating. So so for me, the, there's two reasons, two main reasons why I dive alone. Um, what one of them is, um, and, 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 you know, 99% of my diving alone is, is done from the shore. You don't need to organize anybody but yourself. You don't, you're not stuck to a timetable. You're not stuck to sharing transport, all that sort of stuff. I can, I can, you know, drop things, you know, on the spur of the moment and go for a dive in it. And it's real easy from that point of view. The, the other side of it for me is that, um, you know, while I do like, diving with the right people and sharing the experience with the right people. A lot of the reason I go diving is actually for my own, I guess, psychological state or peace of mind or whatever, you know, but it's, it's, it's my Zen place, my sort of healing place, my place to relax and all of that sort mm. of stuff. And it's a lot easier to do that for me when I'm on my own than when I'm with somebody else. Yeah. I think your sentiment there is echoed by, you know, a lot of experienced sparrows and like, how, how do you, how do you learn, like about this though, Pat, because there is a fair bit of risk risk involved with spearing, and um, particularly when you're starting out, like um, you know, and, and we we're creatures we're creatures where we learn from mistakes as much as anything, and some of the mistakes you can make when you're spearfishing uh, can be fatal. Um, I echo your sentiments completely, and I I still love diving alone. For me, it's similar to you. Like I. 
I find it a place of deep relaxation and um, I find myself 100% in the moment and it's where I can get a clear head and some space. And um, if you, if you, <laughs> even if you're with a good buddy, sometimes it disrupts that, right? So I, I, I 100% understand what you're saying, but how, how does, where, where do you, it's, I'm, I don't even know what I'm asking here. It's basically, it's like, um, how do you guys know when they can do it and when they shouldn't do it? Yeah, well, uh, and that, that, that's actually, that's the, the crux of the matter because if I look back on my diving experience and, and I can well remember when I first started getting really keen on proper proper spearfishing, proper free diving, and, and I remember going out and sort of training and off the south coast in Wellington and my 7 mil suit and 18 or 20 metres of water on my own and, <laughs> and, and wondering why my legs and arms were getting a bit twitchy on, you know, when I got back to the surface. But it was all right because I had my fish, so I was fine. But when I look back <laughs> on it, it I, I'm horrified at it. I, I'm, I, I'm just amazed that I even survived it, really, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, so so your guy from, where was it, New England or whatever, um, he actually yeah. had a really good point. You know, there, there are times where it's actually perfectly appropriate. And, you know, if you think about, in your old, old home region of, of Taranaki and, and your Plymouth around the breakwater or whatever, mm-hmm. you don't need to be with a buddy for that, you know. No, and no. and if you're diving, you know, 10 metres or less, you know, as, as long as you've, you're pretty experienced, you know, I, I think it, I think it's perfectly, perfectly reasonable to expect that you can go out on your own. <sighs> I, I guess there are other dangers, you know, things like boats and stuff like that where if you're with somebody else and, you know, you've got multiple floats or somebody looking out on the surface, there's definitely um, advantages to that. But if you choose your dive site carefully and if you if you actually, I, I think you've got to actually consciously limit where you go and like, you know, how far you go and how deep you're diving and, and you know, as you were talking about your, your surface intervals and your dive times and that, there's no reason why it can't be safe and, um, and, and why people shouldn't be able to enjoy diving on their own yeah in some ways when this guy read his letter to me i was i was pleased i was pleased that he understood and he was rightfully paranoid about some of the risks however i think paranoia and anxiety comes from a place where you don't fully understand what the risks are and so you just feel a level of anxiety and you are unable to um sort of work that out in your mind because you just don't fully understand what the hazards are and I, I actually like that in a new diver because I think it shows you you're thinking about it and you understand there are some risks but helping these guys sort of come to terms with what these risks actually are and then being able to make decisions accordingly um, to, to manage that risk that's kind of the for me that's the that's the battle of this whole thing and it like if you go out diving on your own, you are accepting that that your life is in your own hands and you're dealing with increased risks. However, there are a lot of benefits to be had. But I don't know. It's just a, it's a it's a really tough question to confront on a podcast that tries to promote safety and stuff like that, particularly with with newer guys, with newer divers, you know. And um, it's just the default always dive with a buddy. It, it, it's a great rule to have, but there's practical situations and stuff we actually just can't. So that's kind of what this episode I, I wanted to focus in on. The, the other thing that I was that I was thinking was that um, you know when, when I was starting out, there was no chance of, of doing a, um, a a free diving course or a free diving for spearfishers course or anything mm. like that. Mm. And your guy who who's just starting out, you know, it'd be good for him to do a bit of education bit of research on on you know safe free diving practices and learning how to free dive properly and relax and breathe up and all of that sort of stuff and and then use that you know to 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 support your diving whether you're diving with a buddy or or on your own um Mm -hmm. but ultimately that you know when you're a new diver as you know you you're actually as you're getting better like it's in that time when you're developing and improving that i think you're at your greatest risk and you know, it's it's also there's probably a bit of the element of the bravado of youth about it as well, and you know, and feeling bulletproof. So you know, we've got to be careful that um, that you know we don't put people in the situation where they feel bulletproof or feel you know like like nothing can touch them. I think just listening to you as well, I, I think I recognise in my own sort of diving journey this period where I had anxiety and I sort of understood that there were risks and I you know dived very 
conservatively in terms of um, I didn't do much that I thought was challenging, particularly when I was alone. But then you get a couple of wins on the board and you get down to 10 metres and you're lying on the bottom and you look up and you think, cheapers, I'm really getting the hang of this thing. And then I think some of that anxiety goes away and that was what you were using that to sort of manage your decision framework for, for how you dived and stuff. And then, so when that anxiety goes away and all of a sudden you get have those, those moments where there's a fish on the bottom and it's that battle of wits and you want to win and the fish wants to stay alive. And you know, that extra 10 seconds on the bottom is, is possibly going to yield you that fish. So that's what you do and you push it. And sometimes you can feel okay, particularly if you're hyperventilating. Um, even even the slightest little bit, because you, your body's the messages and signals it sends to you are not always correct. Like this is one of the biggest things to having a buddy. It's like if you do push it, they're there for you. But if you do that and you're on your own, you've got no hope. Like you, you you're you're going to drown. So I, I do like to send that message very strongly. But that's kind of that fine line we tread. I think in spearfishing, and I think it's probably probably one of the things that's enjoyable about it. It's like riding a motorbike really fast. There's there's a there's an adrenaline aspect to it that excites us because we're a lot of us are men, and um, but it, it gets us in trouble and, and sometimes people die and it's unfortunate. But it's just like, is it is it just the nature of the the, the activity, Pat? What do you think? Well, I, I don't think we want to take all the risk out of out of our pursuits, out of our sports or, or pastimes or whatever. But there's got to be common sense about it, and you know, I, I know people who who have died from blackout just diving in 10 metres of water, you know, trying to wrestle a cray out of a hole or whatever. And it is very much a personal thing. You know, talking about anxiety and that, um, one of the, the episodes you, you guys had that I really enjoyed and talked about anxiety and, and uh, how they managed it and how their buddies helped manage it was that one with Tim Kaverman. I mm. thought that was fascinating. And, um, you know, I'd say, I'd, well, I know that he's not alone in, in feeling like that. Um, oh, yeah, hundred percent. For him, for him, being able to have buddies around who could support him but not pressure him to do stuff was really good, you know. But for me, jumping in the water and you know, just when you when you when you've got your gear on and you put your, your face under the water and all of a sudden the the world behind you slips away, you know, and that's um, and and if I've got to be keeping an eye on a buddy all the time, you know, that I don't get that same sort of benefit from it, I suppose. Yeah, some big thoughts, some big thinking. I've, I've, I've thought long and hard about the subject and, and, and sort of some of the things I wanted to approach. I guess one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was um, the risks we face. Um, we've identified them briefly. We've talked about the freediving and the, the ease of which um, it, it is. We, we sort of, you know, we, we get into this battle of wits with fish and we're predominantly men that do it. And we love that challenge. That's part of the joy of the sport. When you don't have a buddy, you've got no one there to get you back to the service should you push it too far. What are some of the other um, risks that you have if you don't have a buddy out with you that you need to understand in order to plan a dive adequately? I should have just I'll pro provide that as well. Well, there's, there's lot, lots of risks. Obviously, things like currents and that. You know, you get carried away, and if no one's there to be with you or to to see you being swept away, you know, you could be screwed. I think it's really important that that whenever you go diving, you let someone know where you're going and and for how long. I think that's mm. really, important. you know, at least somebody can come out and um and find you if you've, been, if you've been swept away. But yeah, we've talked about boats. We've talked about things like shallow water blackout. I, I guess potentially, you know, there's medical events and stuff like that as well that that could be managed. Um, mm. Uh, there's there's plenty of people who suffer from asthma or you know um, might suffer from heart ailments or or epilepsy or whatever. But you know you like to think that if you're going out with those people that they would be um, letting you know what you know what their issues and, and stuff were. But um, no, I think most of the risks are the obvious ones: um, mm. entanglement, um, you know, all of those sorts of things as well. I'll give you a recent a recent scenario I had. So I took two guys up to the Sunshine Coast to shore dive this sort of famous um, patch of reef. Um, it's Point Arkwright. I don't mind giving the spot away, but um, basically you paddle off. You can go off a rock wall where there's surf crashing in, and then sometimes it's okay, or you can go in off a sand beach and sort of um, duck dive your way out, and then once you get clear, you're all good, and then you sort of swim out about, 
50, 100 metres, and then the really good reef starts, and it sort of just keeps going for, you know, more than a kilometre, and it's just sort of steadily drops down. I don't think it, um, I've been out like I don't know five or six hundred metres. I think I was still in less than thirteen or fourteen metres of water. But I took these two guys out there. It's a great spot to learn, particularly if the conditions are good, because it doesn't seem you don't get a lot of current there. Um, Maybe at times you do, but I haven't experienced it there. But you can get all sorts of stuff, particularly when you get sort of 300 metres off the beach where a lot of guys don't venture because it's just starting to get too far when you're swimming. And um, I had these two guys out with me and they were learning and I had them out about that sort of 250, 300 metre mark and I was starting to enjoy it <laughs> because all of a sudden, you know, the water was just, you know, around 10, 12 metres and there were fish. Uh, whereas in closer... Sometimes there are fish there, but it was one of those days where it was a little bit quieter. Anyway, these two blokes came up to me, um, and they, you know, I could see they had some. They just had a quick chat while I was diving, and they said, "Look, we we want to head in. He's feeling a bit seasick or whatever. So, um, what do you want to do?" And I just said, "Look, um, you, I'm glad you fellas are together because three of us were out. Um, you guys head in, and I'll keep going." And um, and I kept diving, and, I, and like that was when I started shooting fish. You know, I shot a parrot, and then I shot a mackerel, and something else, and, and it was all good. But then two sharks come in, and I thought, oh, righto. And they're only little sharks, but they were um, enough to piss me off and put me off, like, you know, nice zen breathing. And I, I didn't trust leaving my fish hanging off the float. So I thought, righto, it's time to call it a day. And then I turned around, I've got a bloody 400 meter swim in front of me. I've got two fish on and I've got two sharks chasing me and I'm starting to get cramp in my legs. And I thought, you know, th this is the, this is one of those days and one of those moments where you think, okay, I should have listened to my own advice here. But, you know, I got in, um, I did end up giving up one of these fish because um, my float just drifted back a little bit too far and they got hold of one, ripped it off, and I, and I lost I lost a fish out of it. But I got two back in because I was carrying the mackerel in my hands. I wasn't giving that up. I love those bloody things. And I, I got in, everything was okay, none the worse to wear. They, these sharks followed me all the way right into where the bathers were swimming in the sand. And um, that was sort of one, one example I can think of, a recent one, where it was just practically I wanted to go diving and the two blokes I was with you know, they, they bailed and that was just the way it went and it was just what happened. Um, and I, I can think of dozens of scenarios like that and I, I know you're the same. So, yeah, I don't even sort of know what questions to ask off the back of that, but can you relate some similar stories? Well, it would, it would, have, um, would have made it easier for you, especially with the sharks, but also with your cramp, you know, peace of mind, having, having buddies there. And, you know, the sharks may have been small, but they're often the ones that cause the most trouble. But um, oh, no, the the only thing that I was I, I was thinking about from that situation is, you know, maybe when you go out, you need to have had that discussion with um, with your buddies about, you know, what happens if, if one of us wants to go and what happens if two of us want to go and you know all of that sort of stuff. You know, <laughs> that's one of the things when I'm involved in, in taking kids snorkeling, we have to make all of those decisions and and stuff like that. You know, because some kids get tired, some kids get cold. But you don't want to spoil the um, spoil the experience for those kids that want to stay out there with you. You know, situations like that. Yeah, pr probably my yeah. All of my more dangerous situations have certainly occurred when I've been diving alone. But that's not surprising because I've probably spent more than half my time diving alone. And you know, my worst problems with sharks have been when I've been on my own. So I think that's probably a, a thing that's worth discussing. You know, sharks tend to be. A bit more wary when when there's somebody riding shotgun for you so that's a good point so if you're going to decide to dive alone you've got to think about that and i think i related in my podcast about um you know i got entangled in my float line <laughs> down I remember. Um, and if i'd had a buddy with me then it wouldn't have been a problem in the end you know i survived it but it wasn't wasn't the best experience i think this really it, it does come back to that whole question which we discussed right at the start of, um, you know, where you're going, what you're planning on sparing and, and, you know, how far and how deep and all of that sort of stuff, you know, because I think that's probably the crucial question. And, you know, if you're going to dive on your own, you know, you just, you're just not doing that deep stuff. So one of the big things I think another one you identified was, uh, so our, our biggest risk mitigation strategy for all spearfishing is having a buddy. However, if we've decided not to to dive alone, right, for whatever reason, 
Um, what other misc risk mitigation strategies should we think about? So we've talked about prior planning and obviously grading your dive site and conditions according to the fact that you're going to dive alone. So you, you probably don't want to do a 400 metre swim with current and chasing big pelagic fish and you know, you know you've obviously talked about having a boat float in terms of keeping your fish out of the water to, to mitigate any dramas with sharks ripping stuff off you. Um, do you, do you ever carry like one of those big fluoro um, sausages, like the um, ones you can blow up or whatever, or you know, cup into the wind? I, I normally like if I'm diving with my float boat, I'll have one of them in my float boat because it's real easy to have in there and easy to grab. Mm. Always have a spare knife, you know, because you never know. I know um, uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see if my mate John Breen listens to this, but. Um, He's um, he's renowned for losing knives, so uh, he probably needs to take five or six out with him, I suspect. But one, one of the other things I was thinking about, because again, this comes back to a time when I was diving on my own, is um, it, you hear about it, but nobody, or hardly anybody ever does it, is be ready to drop your weight belt. I, I remember um, diving off the beach in North Taranaki, and it was a place I hadn't dived before, and there was a lot more swell than I expected. And I got caught up in some big waves with um, with lots and lots of white water, and with the white water, I just couldn't get back to the surface. So um, you know, you just in this big maelstrom of white water, and I suddenly thought I'd better drop my weight belt, and and I dropped it, left it there, and popped up to the surface, and I was fine. But um, you know, those sort of situations, and and when I had that entanglement thing, I think I said that you know the last thing that went through my mind, I didn't even think about it till I was back in the boat, was dropping my weight belt. So I think. It's a bit like going on going on a flight, and you know one one thing you know regular travel, traveler told me was always watch the safety briefing, pay attention to the safety briefing. Well, maybe we need to be doing that with spearfishing as well. Just get used to you know checking those things that we should check. You know checking that your fin blades are all right, so they're not going to snap halfway through. You know just remind yourself about your weight belt. Check that you've got a knife and all of those sorts of things. Because um, you know it's sometimes it's those little things that'll trip you up. Um, and not necessarily the big things. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think doing something like that would, you know, probably be a good idea. Today I've got a sweet offer for you. To go with this free episode of the New Spirit podcast, I've got access to some free courses. How cool is that? Go to noobspirit.com forward slash TED. Now, Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving, a frequent guest on the New Spirit podcast, has got several free courses available at newspirit.com forward slash TED. Check it out, Freediving Safety. There's a full video course about how to avoid shallow water blackout, how to be a good buddy, all the fundamentals of just being a good, safe Spiro, and it's all free. Check it out, newspirit.com forward slash TED. There's another one in there as well about how to take a 20 to 30% bigger breath, which will give you more fuel, more time on the bottom, and uh, make you a more effective Spiro. There's also a whole lot of other courses there as well. Check them out, get a 15% discount, newspirit.com forward slash TED. Come and join us on the New Spiro community on Facebook. And uh, you'll get access when you sign up to the Noob Spiro email newsletter. It's called The Floater at noobspiro.com. Just pump in your email and join our community. You'll get the dive day checklist and 10 tips to become a better Spiro as well. And uh, as, as always, we, we would love a review wherever you listen to the show. If you put in a genuine review, it helps other people find the show. Tell your mates about it. Jump on their smartphone and even download a couple of episodes and tell them what a bloody podcast is. So I'll, I'll read you a little bit of my answer back to this guy because um, I put it on the, the New Spirit Community Facebook group and got, tried to get a little bit of a discussion there. And the, the, the sort of the, the, the answers I was getting were, I dive alone, I dive alone, I dive alone. And so a lot of these guys are doing it anyway. And like, I, I, <laughs> I know people are going to do it anyway. So I just want to um, provide some... You know, this guy, he's stuck. He doesn't have a buddy in his state. He's going diving. Like, he's not diving most of the time. I don't think he's ever diving any more than probably 15 feet. You know, um, he is dealing with increased risk because he's by himself. But what I said to him was do a risk assessment um, before you head to the beach. So in terms of, like, your weather planning and your location planning. And then when you get there, do another one. So um, conditions. So, you know, obviously large swell, boat traffic, current. Um, 
entry point, exit point, um, contingency plans for how you're going to get out if something happens or what you're going to do about it or what you're going to be able to do about it in terms of maybe yelling out to someone or something like that. Um, having a good understanding of fitness, your own capabilities, like, and if, there's, if it requires too much of a swim and there's a potential for current or anything else, um, maybe avoid it, just choose another spot. Sharks, we talked about um, like with the, with the boat float and then um, free diving we've talked about as well. So, you know, this, this idea of diving conservatively, like a lot of the free diving instructors laugh at it because they know what we're like. We are, sh- we are shit at diving conservatively. This is one of the biggest issues with diving alone, particularly when you're a young guy. And particularly when you're starting to get competent, that seems to be the worst part of it. Um, did you? Sorry, interrupt me at any time, by the way, Pat. <laughs> the other thing was contingency. So, like, um, if your mask strap strap breaks, are you going to be able to make it back to shore? If the surf picks up, is your exit point going to be okay? Um, if the tide changes and the current increases in the opposite direction, are you going to be all right to make it out of the water? Um, there were a few of the things that I've put in this risk assessment for guys to think about. Would you would you add anything or, or have you got any comments? Uh, well, um, this program that I'm involved with back here, Experiencing Marine Reserves, where mm. we take kids out, we have to do pre-dive risk assessments for that. And, you know, and it's all of those things that you've been talking about. And... It's actually not a bad idea to to sort of do that as a matter of course. I, I don't know whether it'd be useful to have, you know, I don't know, like a sticker you could put on your float or something like that, you know, say so check this, check this, blah, 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 you know, just the things that you were talking about with that. You, you were talking about uh, what happens if your mask strap breaks and stuff like that. Well, um, you know, if you don't go diving that often, there's probably a, a, some sort of a chance that that might happen. If, if you're Ross Gurau, who lives down in, um, in Gisborne Way, um, he just gets some Lasonia seaweed and makes a new mask <laughs> out of that, but he's pretty in <laughs> so, uh Kiwi ingenuity, eh? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but, yeah, but there's always the unforeseen, and I think, um, I, I think sometimes you've just actually got to rely on, on yourself and rely on your own confidence in the water and your ability to get yourself out of trouble. But ultimately, you can't you can't eliminate all risk, you know. And and like I said at the start, uh, and you equate it to, to riding or, or motorbikes or whatever. And you know, I used to race motorbikes and that. And there's an implicit risk in, in anything like that in any motorsport, whether you do skiing or snowboarding or anything like that, that you could hurt yourself or worse, you know. And that's sort of a part of why we do that. Do it, you know. For me, diving isn't just about about getting a feed it isn't just about being in the water it's actually the thrill and and a little bit of that implicit risk in there as well so mm. you know that's that's how i feel about it <laughs> awesome awesome unless you had something else to add pat i was maybe going to get you to read me um your article slash sage advice slash poem <laughs> so you want me to read it in its entirety yeah give it to me barry crump style Okay, so Barry Crump, yeah, apparently he was a bit of a misogynist bully, but anyway, I love his I love his books. <laughs> so was Bob Marley. So what do you do? <laughs> exactly. Okay, so um, this is my article or, or my proposed article that I wrote um, some months ago, Never Dive Alone, Always Dive With a Buddy. Sage advice, and that has been the advice given ever since I started diving 45 years ago, and it's still no less valid today. But here's the thing. I dive alone. In fact, I dive alone 95% of the time. That doesn't mean I don't enjoy getting out with a bunch of mates for a dive, but that when I do, I take off and do my own thing. A disclaimer here, I don't recommend that people do this. However, I suspect that I'm not alone in this desire to dive solo. And while I'm not going to try and justify it, I'm going to try and explain it. Firstly, diving on your own is simpler. You know where you're going, diving, and for how long. You have an idea of of where you want to dive there, weed lines, snooping for snapper, chasing pelagics, and your target species. You know what depth range you're comfortable with. Also, you don't need to worry about tangled float lines, lost knives, being shot, and so much more. That is the simple, more concrete stuff. And now for the abstract stuff. As uh, Dennis Denuto says in the great Australian movie, The Castle, it's all about the vibe. It's all about the vibe. For me, going into the sea, entering what for some is an alien kingdom is my way of finding inner peace. From the physical side, water is restful and soothing. 
when I'm feeling good, my breathing becomes slower and deeper, my heart rate drops, and I'm able to relax in a way that's impossible anywhere else. Of course, part of that relaxation is letting go of anything else that intrudes in the mind, those day-to-day -day worries and anxieties that dominate your thoughts at times. Having practiced some degree of mindfulness over the last few years, it's very much that thing of being in the moment, emptying your mind of everything except the immediate physical environment and an acute awareness of your body and how it's responding. It's also being attuned to your environment, the currents and eddies, the movements of the waves, the angle and direction of the sun, the clarity and temperature of the water, the noises, the clicks of shrimps and urchins, the creak and rumble of rocks and a heavy swell, the distant sound of a motor, the bait fish and their behaviour. Are they looking relaxed or nervous? Are they hanging around a particular area? Are there bigger fish nearby? Spearfishing for me is an extremely analytical pursuit, whether consciously or unconsciously, you're continually analysing that input of data from yourself and or your environment. When you're on your own, all of this is that much easier to achieve. It's just you and the ocean. But what about safety? What if you get caught up in a fishing line or a net? What if you're hurt somehow, tossed by a wave, impaled by a scorpion fish or bitten by a shark? What if you get swept by currents out to sea? What if your boat drifts away, leaves you, leaving you stranded? And what if you black out? Some of these risks are less credible than others, and there are none that we're immune from. But we take risks every day in our lives. We learn to manage risks and keep ourselves as safe as is possible. When I dive alone, I acknowledge those risks. I know no one will be there to rescue me. I don't dive as deep or as long as I might when I'm competing, for example, with my buddy following me like a faithful Labrador. I'm not recommending diving alone, but I do imagine many people will read this and it will strike a chord with them. In the end, it's your decision of how you want to dive and who you want to dive with. I dive alone. You can say your name too. Oh, yeah. That's what's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, no, it's a really good piece, Pat. It's um, thought provoking, and uh, it was part of the inspiration behind this episode. It's great to get you on, actually. Finally, after a little while, um, two, two things now. <laughs> Number one question: Is it a selfish desire to, that keeps us diving alone? Selfish can be can have negative connotations. I, I think it's actually important that you are selfish sometimes that you pay heed to yourself. So, so yes, in both contexts, it is a selfish thing. Sometimes it is just about me wanting to do what I want to do, uh, but, but sometimes it's more than that. It's what I need to do. Yeah, I agree. I think um, part of what comes through in your, in your poem, your story, whatever we want to call it, um, is, this, is this idea of self-care because that's what spearfishing is for us. And particularly if you, you, you do use it as a, like a mindfulness tool and you, you accept that the risk that you take when you dive alone and you're 100% responsible for it as an adult but you, and you're choosing to do it mindfully, you know what I mean? Like I, I, I get that side of it but I also wanted to pose the question. It's, a, it's, um, it's, it's one that I think um, we all need to have a look at. But um, the last sort of thing I wanted to ask you, Pat, was... Um, we've talked about diving with, uh, I don't want to say shit buddies, but let, <laughs> let's say, let's say less than perfect buddies. Um, a lot of these guys don't know how to be a good buddy. Um, cause part of it is not being high maintenance. Um, but when you're new, I think you, you are going to be high maintenance and you're not, you don't need to feel guilty for that, but how can we help these guys be really good buddies to each other when they do dive together. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I think that's when, when you're good at something, it, it's actually responsible to, to share your your abilities and use your abilities to help um, develop other people. And, and I, I've actually had a lot of joy out of doing that with, with divers. As you said, some people are, are, are good learners and fast learners and some people are slower learners. And that can be really frustrating, but, but I, I think it is, worth actually spending the time and, you know, talking about what you do and why you do it, you know, why, you know, when you're, when you're swimming alongside somebody and you've both got float lines, one stays on the right, one stays on the left and you, and you do that, you know, cause it, it doesn't seem obvious for beginners, you know? So mm. often a lot of what seems implicit to us actually isn't implicit for, for beginners. So, mm. you know, we need to be explicit in what we teach. So, um, yeah. And, and 
you know, safety and all of that is is definitely one of those things. But that said, there are there are some people, experienced divers I've dived with that I just don't enjoy diving with. Our, our diving our diving styles don't align, and um, and it's probably a mutual thing. I don't know. Mm. Um, and, and it's 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 just one of those things that you have to accept. And you've probably found the same thing. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, I think um, a lot of the time we talk about hunting techniques on the show and stuff and um, your behaviour on the bottom of, of the ocean or wherever it in the water column it is that you're hunting these fish, while it is important, I think probably 80% of a hunting technique is just finding the fish. And um, when you're in a buddy behaviour, um, one guy is generally the leader and if he starts heading in a direction that you know is not going to be fruitful, then you kind of you know, you don't want to follow the guy because you're like, well, it's a waste of time. I want to go in this direction. And, um, or sometimes you've just got a gut feeling and you want to go with it, you know what I mean? And, and you, but you also want to be a good buddy and there's this, there's this constant tension that you deal with when you dive with a buddy. It's like uh, this compromise that you make every time. And, um, you know, yeah, like I said, 80% of it is actually just being in the right place and then, and then you get the fish, you know? And um, so I get, I 100% get that side of things. And when you're diving with a newbie, they don't know where to go. And so I guess one bit of advice to the newbies is like when you buddy up, just like be prepared to sort of take a, uh, you know, like a secondary role and just listen to the advice for the plan. Like when I came and dived with you in Taranaki, um, I pretty much wanted a bit of an overview of the area and what your general plan was so that I could work in with you and make sure I was heading in the right direction. And um, it was relatively shallow, shallow, but it was. I had a really bloody good time. And and then a couple of days later, you were at work, so I went and dove some of those places by myself. And um, and I was quite comfortable doing it because I, I then knew the area. You had given me like an introduction to it. So um, it's kind of one of those um, one of those things, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, and and I'd I'd expect you know like <laughs> if I came over there because I've never dived um, that coast over there. And you were talking about that place you dived off the beach before, you know. I, I could go and dive it on my own, but I'd get a lot more out of diving it with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the beauty of experience, isn't it? And, um, you know, you tap into your buddy's expertise. And I think if you've dived a place with a buddy and you know what the conditions are, you're in a much better position to assess the risk next time you decide to head out, whether it's with a buddy or by yourself. And um, it's a huge thing. It's just under, understanding where you're going diving and what you're actually going to do there. Um, you're much better able to make uh, an educated decision. Um but yeah, no, nah, cool. All right, sweet Pat. Hey, thanks for making time, man. No, nah, good one, mate. Catch ya. Hey, noobers, it's uh, Jeremy here from Spearing Magazine with an uh, with an update for you guys. Shrek and Turbo have been doing such a great job with uh, telling guys about Spearing Magazine that we've actually sold out of most of our back issues and catalogs. But uh, I just wanted to let you guys know that uh, we have an international subscription available just for you guys. Yeah, from Spearing Magazine. I'm Jeremy Gamble. Thank you, guys. Go to SpearingMagazine.com. Check out the uh, international subscription. Aw, yeah. Spearo Log. An actual logbook for spearfishing. Yes. It's a paper form, and perhaps we could go digital in the future. But at the moment, Log is available right now on Amazon.com to capture your dives and help you replicate past results. Because if you're capturing that fish in those specific conditions and it doesn't happen every week, there's probably some unique variables that are allowing that phenomenon to take place. So record them in your dive log. You can go back, you can have a look at data over time and you can see what works, what makes your spots and locations tick. Get Log on Amazon.com today. Log by Noob Spiro. Oh my God. As usual, real pleasure chatting with Pat. Um, he's a Spiro I really respect and enjoy diving with myself in the past and um, He's a great guy and it's really cool to chat about something so controversial because um, if you do accept full responsibility for yourself when you do choose to dive alone uh, and you acknowledge that you're going to deal with increased risks uh, and, you're, and, you're, 
and you accept that risk, then it's your life and you can do what you what you choose to do. But just be aware of the decision you are making. But um, in Pat's area of the world too, particularly like a lot of the diving is off the rocks and you, you're quite shallow a lot of the time. There's, there's plenty to see and do quite close to the shore. And if you are a fit person that's been diving for years, um, you know, you are dealing with a level of risk anyway, but you can have a have a great dive. And uh, like I said, I'd still do it myself. But um, my experience has changed a little bit. Um, I've got to say that all of the countless interviews I've done with people talking about some of their near misses, escapes and buddies drowning and things like that, it has influenced and changed the way um, I dive and my practices and not just what I preach, but but what I do as well. And I've found a lot of joy in learning to to dive with others. And I can get a lot of that mindfulness stuff we were talking about and, and Pat talked about in his article that um, I get from got, used to get from diving alone. I now get it um, with the buddies I dive with now. Basically, I started off with a whole bunch of new dive buddies 12 months ago when I came back to Brisbane. And what happened was I had about 10 or 12 guys that I was diving with and I, I taught quite a few of these dudes as well. And the pool slowly whittled, whittled down and, until I just found four or five guys that I, I sort of grooved and gelled with really well. Um, we, we work well together. Um, I know what I'm going to get when we head out for a day's diving and they're dependable. And they also have a similar... Uh, approach to ethics, um, sustainability and attitude towards fish and, you know, the attitude that you bring to a boat or a shore dive, um, you know, I know they're going to look after me and I, and equally in turn they know that I'm going to look after them. And I've got that small dependable group, which is what a lot of Spiros tend to do after time. Now, one of the hardest things when you're new is breaking into one of those groups and getting on people's radar. And um one of the things that we've got cool that's real well, that's local here in Brisbane is a free diving group that caters well for Spiros. Uh, it's fitness and free diving um, training to improve that part of your um, spearfishing, and it's called the Brisbane Bull Sharks. Now these groups are around. There's other sort of fringe groups as well, like underwater hockey. And spearfishing clubs are huge for this as well. Sometimes they have regular training. These are a fantastic place to hone your skills and become a person that other guys and girls want to dive with because you're going to have a skill set and you're not, you're not going to be keeping – like if you go out with guys that have been diving for a while, they want to dive sometimes a little bit deeper and they're relatively unsympathetic towards guys that can't dive – you know beyond 30 feet or something you know like if you want to go out off brisbane here a lot of the spearfishing we do offshore starts at 30 feet and so if that's flat out your maximum depth and and you go out on a boat it's hard to get uh continually get invites if the guys you're going out with want to dive 50 or 60 feet uh or 20 meters um or 15 meters whatever your whatever the numbers are um so going along to one of these free diving groups can rapidly improve your fitness and the awareness of your own body which gives you some skills which can get you potentially more invites and a lot of it is like it's not so much what other people can show you've got you've got to be self-motivated to become the type of person that other guys want to dive with uh, unfortunately this is just part of it there's no gifts in spearfishing like a lot a lot of it is hard work yeah you can listen to a podcast you can read articles but you can also train as well to make yourself better and make yourself someone that other people want to dive with so that's one way to do it if you're a new guy and you're listening and I, I hope that helps i don't know if it does but anyway that's my experience so i've got these four or five guys with i dive with now um and you know 12 months ago barely any of them uh, we're very good at the free diving side of things now. You know, a couple of them are, are diving better than me, and uh, they're a fantastic bunch of guys to dive with. And we, we don't really, one of the things the benefits of diving with people for a while is that after a while, the system's set, and there's not a lot of communication that appears to go on because you have some intuitive understanding of what's going on around you. Now, Pat talked about one of those things with float line awareness. This is a huge thing. I've been annoyed with you know with Turbo. Back in the day when we used to dive together, we had float line tangles and um, neither one of us really accepting responsibility for some of the tangles we got ourselves into. And they can be a really frustrating thing. And uh, it disrupts, you know, if you get that one... Do like at the moment, I haven't been out diving for four or... Four 
even five weeks because of work and family stuff. Um, so when I get out diving, sometimes I just want to have a good day. I don't want to deal with um, any extra stress or drama. I just want to go diving. And uh, I think a lot of sparrows are the same. It's that it's that activity we're looking to do that's going to give us a bit of peace, a bit of uh, you know, like a, a bit of time out. And if we're going out and we're catering to the needs of others, then it's not really serving its purpose for us in terms of you know our sport. So this is one of the, these are some of the factors you got to think about anyway. Um, Benefits of do- buddy diving. I'm going to get into this. There's three articles I'm going to refer you to, uh, or two podca- two articles in one podcast. One is uh, 101, episode 47, 101 Spearfishing Buddy Protocol. This is an e- excellent episode, and uh, it talks about the benefits of spearfishing. Just just quickly, obviously, we've talked a lot about it, but you can save your, your, your mate's life in the event of a blackout, or... You, or your mate could save your life. These are two very compelling reasons to have a buddy when you go out. Uh, another thing Jeremy Gamble talks a lot about uh, from Spearing Magazine is you land more fish. And this is definitely true. You know, like I recently posted a video up on the new Spearing YouTube channel of um, my mate shooting his first mackerel. And he didn't try, he didn't let he didn't let it play out. He tried to pull it up too fast because he's, he's worried about losing the fish. But, in the, you know, and, and because of his action, it nearly tore out, and I'd, I, re, I sort of swam over and just ended up diving on the fish, and we got it up, and it was okay. But it was a near near tear off. But um, you know that was that's that's an example of, of being a, of being a good buddy. It's just being there at the right moment, and um, you know offering some advice about you know how to do that differently in the future. Particularly if, if you are lucky enough to get out with someone that's a bit experienced than you, you can learn a hell of a lot even in a day. And um, never never take that for granted. Always be grateful for the people that um, have shared their time and expertise. Just like the hundred odd guests we've had on the podcast, you know, like. Um, these guys are choosing to look back and, and help and, and lend a hand out to the next generation of spirits coming through and uh, it's a huge thing uh, but you definitely put more fish on the boat there's second shots, there's back to back sharks are much less inclined to come near you and steal your fish if there's a, num- a number of you in the water so that's a huge one um, another thing I wanted to touch on was if there's three of you say you're, you're, you've got comfortable diving to 30 feet while you're spearfishing right you get on the bottom in 10 metres of water and you're comfortable there. If you head out with some more experienced guys and you dive in a three, this is a really good practice because one dives and two stay on the surface. Now this will logically mean that you are getting double the time on the surface that you are spending underneath the water, if you know what I mean. And Knowing that two guys are on the top watching out for you when you're coming up from a dive, say if you're that 30-foot diver and you're in good conditions with two buddies, that's a day to dive down and try 40 feet or 45 feet. This is a perfect opportunity to do it. So if you can get in a a three-way system going, it's good for maintaining a surface interval and it's a good time to actually maybe push for a little bit more depth than you have done in the past. So it's another fantastic way to dive with buddies. Um, One of the other best things I like about diving with, with, with buddy is the high five moments, the fist bumps, you know, seeing people get their first fish, these things are, they bring me as much joy now as shooting my own fish. I really like putting people on a fish. It's fun. Um, ph- photographers get it out, out of capturing images of fish. My thing's still more like, um, you know, watching guys take their first fish. It's absolutely bloody magic. I love it. Another thing is if you buddy up with people, particularly if you dive with a few different people and get out of that comfort zone of diving with those same four or five people, it can be really good because, um, you'll learn something from other divers. Every single diver does something different than other people do. If you've spent substantial amount of time in the water and you've been thinking about it and concentrating about it and you know, you've know you made mistakes in the past and you've adjusted your diving, you are probably doing something different and so are your buddies. You can observe that, you can just question them when you get back up the surface or on the boat or on the shore or whatever and you can learn a hell of a lot just from those little moments. So that's a good compelling reason to dive with others. So look, um, check that. Check out that full podcast, New Spirit Podcast number 47, 101 Spearfishing Buddy Protocol. And uh, Turbo also wrote an article which similar follows similar lines, but it's got some different information in it. Go to newspirit.com or just type in Spearfishing Buddy Protocol on Google and that should come up. Um, it's, it's the Bulletproof Buddy Protocol borrowed from Ted Hardy, which is in episode 96. 
Um, and Ted talks a little bit about some free uh, freediving courses that he's got as well. And um, check that out at freedivesafety.com. But um, the Bulletproof Buddy Protocol, it's basically borrowed from scuba diving. Basically what it is is like one of you gets in the water and the other – oh, sorry, two of you get in the water – and one guy is the leader, one guy is the follower. The leader goes, he dives, comes back up, and then the follower becomes the leader, and they swap. Uh, th- th- it sounds super simple. It actually is. But um, it's a really effective way to make sure that you stay in a buddy group, and you don't move until your buddy's surfaced, even if it's bad vis and he surfaces 20 metres away. Um, he should swim over to you, you, sh- you should be breathing up, and then you're away you go again. Um, A good way in what we discovered just chatting with Pat there too is just to have a plan before you go into the water. If one guy is more experienced or he knows the area, he should be the one that um, sort of provides the most direction in terms of what you're doing unless for some reason the other guy's got a real good reason. But Sometimes it requires just a little bit of communication, a bit more communication on the boat or, or on the shore before you get in the water and then you've got a bit more of an idea and a bit of a plan about how to go about things. But uh, yeah, so three things to have a look at and uh, I'll link them up in today's show notes. So if you go to noobspero.com forward slash dive alone, I'll have a list of um, articles, podcasts you can check out and um, really cool to address this um, question. So thanks for sending it in. Um, your questions that you do send into Shrek at noobspero.com, um, they, do, they, they, they do feel, you know, a lot of the next episodes coming up and, uh, you know, so just uh, want to encourage you, if you do have questions, struggles in your diving, you can email me anytime, shrek at nobespero.com. And um, if it can be addressed, I'll try and do it on the podcast. So, yeah, Steve. Uh, Steve from Boston, Massachusetts. Hope this is helpful for you, man, and um, gives you a few ideas about um, when you can dive alone or maybe when you can get away with it, but also being aware that you are taking 100% responsibility for your own life if you do choose to dive alone and you are not taking your biggest um, safety mechanism with you. But also just want to let you know that people do do it um, and they do it knowingly and they do it on purpose and they do it with full knowledge that you know they're missing out uh on having a safety mechanism should they need it. So, but you can do it. You can do it. Uh, but I'm not advising it. <laughs> uh, tough episode, controversial, as usual. Maybe get some hate mail. Email me, Shrek at nospirit.com. This is clear as mud. Thanks for nothing, Shrek. Uh, all right. Hey, um, another quick update. I'm heading down to Melbourne later this year by myself. I'm going to do an interview down there. If you want to help out with that, go to patreon.com forward slash noobspero and become a patron. There's um, 17 or 18 of you blokes on there now, or ladies and gentlemen. And uh, every dollar helps. Thank you guys for supporting the show. I'm out. Is your major issue spearfishing all about equalizing? I got good news for you. We've been pumping Ted Hardy's immersion freediving equalizing classes for a while now for free on the No Spirit podcast because we love it that much. It's effective. Now, his roadmap to friends will class is absolutely excellent. It's a full-on video course that will help you to master the technique of Frenzel because you're probably doing Valsalva. Now, Ted's sweetened it up a little bit more. He's got a 15% discount code. Go to noobspero.com forward slash Ted, get full access to the Roadmap to Frenzel Equalizing class, and if you don't learn how to Frenzel within 30 days, he'll give you a full money back refund. Now, everyone wants to get beyond that 15 to 40 foot mark, that five to 10 meter mark, and you don't want to be going upright to have to equalize. You need to learn the Frenzel Equalizing technique, and the best way to do that is spend a little bit of time doing Ted Hardy's course. Come to noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Get a 15% discount. Enjoy. Now, I don't know about you, but I love new gear. And spearfishing.com.au have got a huge range. Mad flat shipping rate, especially in Australia. And if you use the code noobspiro, you not only support us, but you get $20 off every purchase over $200. That's right, pump in the code NOOBSPARO at checkout, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O at spearfishing.com.au and you will save 20 bucks on every purchase over $200. No-brainer. Thanks, Adreno.